Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, and we have seen the architecture part of our SIC machine. It consists of uh, 32 KB of memory, five registers. So this and all we have one through and each register is of 24 bit length or three bytes or one word. Okay. So data formats, your SIC allows only the integer format as well as the character format. So character is a 8 bit ASCII and integers is 24 bit binary number or one word. Okay. And there are two instruction formats. One is, uh, sorry, uh, there is only one instruction format that is of 24 bit. And there are two addressing modes. One is direct, other one is index. Index is represented by x made equal to one, right? And uh, so we just uh, went through the load and store instructions, which comes into the category of uh, data transfer instructions, wherein load instruction is to load the contents of memory to one of the three registers. That is your A, M, and uh, sorry, A, X, and L registers, right? And uh, LDCH is used to load one character from the memory to the register, right? And usually the LDCH loads only onto the accumulator, right? And the store instructions also we have came across. And the store instructions transfers the data from the registers to the memory location, right? And uh, we can do it from all the three registers, that is uh, A, X and as well as L, right? So these things we have seen and also we have seen the HCCH storing a character from the accumulator to the memory, which can be done both using direct mode as well as the indexing mode. And also the special instruction we have seen, the store status word. So then, and we have had a look at the arithmetic instructions. While performing arithmetic instructions, one of the operand must be in accumulator, other one can be in memory, or other one must be in memory. It both can be done both direct and as well as indexed mode. Right. Uh, so find them. Then logical instructions, we do have only the logical and as well as the logical or instruction. Right. Then we have finally seen at the end of the class the TIX instruction. The TIX increments the register X contents by one and then the incremented contents of the X will be compared with the M. So whether X is greater than M or less than M or equal to M, this will be the result stored in the conditional code or your status word, right? That's what is your uh, TIX operation will do, right? I think we have stopped at this point. We'll proceed further from here today Right, we're going to we'll, uh, further continue with, yeah. The next instruction, what we are supposed to learn is the COMP instruction, compare instruction. It is very similar to our TIX instruction, but here nothing will be incremented. Here the accumulator contents is compared with the specified memory location and the conditional code is set accordingly. So it means the accumulator minus M will be done. So if we get a positive result, accumulator is greater than M. If we get a negative result, accumulator is less than M. Or if we get the equal to result then, or if we get the zero result, then accumulator is equal to your memory location. That's what is the compare instruction does. It sets the conditional code. And the next, suppose, the usually after the compare instruction, we may have the instruction something like a jump. Jump if equal to, jump if, if greater than, jump if less than. So these instructions will be executed based on the result in the conditional code. So that's what is the compare instruction does. Compares the contents of accumulator with the memory. Right? So these are the possibilities. Just as I mentioned, if the status word is 0, 0, it is equal to. If it is 0, 1, accumulator is greater. If it is less than, then accumulator will go. Means the status word will going to be one Z, right? This is this also comes into the category of our logical instruction. Next set of instructions we're going to have a look at, which are our branch instructions. There are two types of branch that are possible. One is unconditional branch. In unconditional branch, we don't check any condition. That branch happens without checking the condition. So it is represented by J. For example, 
and we can perform a backward jump as well as a forward jump. Means the instructions are written in a continuous manner. We can either jump to the instruction which is ahead of us or the instruction which is already previously present, right? So just see the example. We have a start and so what is start? I'll tell you later. So when we deal with the assembly directive, we're going to talk about the start. Fine. And you can see at 2000, we have the start of the program, 2003. And why three increment? Because each size of a length of the instruction is three bytes. That is one word. So the instruction length will going to be three bytes at any point of time, right? Okay, at 2012, we have an instruction J. Next, next is a label. Label is some other address, okay? So at next is now present at the address 3000. Right, so it is an unconditional branch, so we don't need to bother about uh, checking any condition. Right, once this execution, this instruction gets executed, we should go to the address next, that is 3000. So, what happens when you are executing the instruction present at 2012? Contents of the program counter will be 2015, that is plus 3, the next instruction. Now what happens, effective address is calculated, something like this. Effective address is equal to, three. sorry, it is supposed to be 3000. Uh, 3000 minus 2012, whatever the answer we get, that will be the displacement. This next return here at 2012 will be replaced by that displacement, right? So the displacement will be added to the contents of your PC and the resulting effective address at that place will going to be reaching. That means when the jump next happens, the PC will be loaded with the contents of 3000. Means PC will be loaded with the address 3000 so that the jump goes to the add instruction at 3000. Fine. Right? That's an unconditional jump. Fine. Right. We should also have a conditional branch. Right. The conditional branch should check a condition. So means to say previous instruction must be a so the instruction branches based on checking a condition, conditional codes are set based on the execution of previous instruction. The result of the previous instruction, it will be either greater than, less than or equal to. Right. So just an example, we the program is starting at uh, 2000, 2003, 2006, some other instructions we have. But at 2009, we have an instruction, compare, yeah. So compare accumulator contents with the memory location which will set the conditional code either to greater or less or equal to. Now at 2012, we have an instruction, jump equal, jump if equal, J-E-Q, jump if equal. What is equal? If the conditional code is equal, then jump to next. Next is a label, right? Next is at present at 2000, 3000, same as previous. Now, PC is containing 2015, CC, conditional code if conditional code is zero zero that means if the previous instructions execution has resulted a conditional code zero zero then pc will be now replaced with now pc will be 2015 which will be replaced with 3000 so the branch happens to 3000 and the con con condition continues means and the, and the execution continues from 3000 this happens only if the condition code is zero zero the same Three more, two more conditions we may have. That is jump less than JLT, jump less than. Then if this conditional code is one zero, then the PC will be loaded with 3000. Else PC will be same 2015. In a similar fashion, we have jump JGT, jump if greater than. If the conditional code is zero one, then the PC will be loaded with 3000. Else PC will be 2015, right? So this how the conditional branch instructions will be executed, right? So JEQ is one, JLT, JGT. These are the three possible branch instructions. All the three works based on the conditional course and the conditional course are set based on the result of execution of previous instruction. Here in our case is compare instruction. Compare the accumulator contents with the memory. If it is equal, zero, zero, if it is uh, Less than it is one zero. If it is greater than, it is going to be zero. Right. So this way, the conditional branch instructions will be executed. We shall proceed further. We have subroutine branch. 
What is subroutine? Subroutine is a small piece of code. You can uh, visualize as a function. A function is called. Once the function is called, control is transferred to the function. After execution of the function, control should be transferred back to the calling program. Right? So such sort of subroutine call is also accommodated in your SIC machine. So it is used to call the subroutine and return back from the subroutine. That's what is the function. So, so as to return back from the subroutine after the subroutine completes execution, subroutine address need to be stored. So in other machines, what we have already learned, maybe in our C programming or in our what you call microprocessor, the return address will usually be stored in stack. SIC is a very simple computer. We don't have the stack concept here. So for that reason, the return address will be stored in a register. That is the register L or the link register. So link register is used to store the return address before branching to subroutine and use the contents of link register so as to return back to the caller. That's how it works. Have a look at the example. Same program. We have we are starting from the address 2000. But usually what is this 2003, 2003 and all is for our visualization. That's all. But your machine uses hexadecimal addresses. Remember that. So instead of representing the hexadecimal addresses, we are using 2000. 2003 like that way so that we can understand it in a simpler manner. Fine. So later on also we're going to use something like 000 or something like that. So don't bother about it. Fine. Just to keep track of the address, it is being written. Right. At 2026, we have a jump to subroutine one. Now it is not an unconditional jump. It is a jump subroutine. We have a separate instruction, but here it is just written as J. Right. And the subroutine 1 is present in the address 3034. Now what happens is, we see when the J instruction is being executed, we see content will be 3 next to the 2026, that is your 2029, right? And PC contents, that is 2029, will be loaded onto L register, means we are storing the return address onto the link register. We are storing the return address that is the PC value onto the link register, right? And the address of subroutine that is 3033 is now loaded onto your PC. Means your program continues execution from 3030 until when? Until there is an instruction called as return from subroutine or sub instruction if it is found, then the reverse of this process will happen. What is the reverse of this process? The contents of L will be loaded back to PC. So the program continues execution from 2029. So this is how the call and return of the subroutine will happen. So using link register for subroutine uh, call and return is a simple mechanism. So looking at it, it's a simple mechanism. But this cannot call recursive functions or a function call within a function because at the most, only one return address can be stored onto your link register. More than one cannot be stored. That's the problem. So multiple subroutine calls or nested subroutine calls is not possible with SIC machine. And it is not also needed for us because our intention is to build a simple assembler, loaders, linkers. That's what is the intention. So as many features as we need, we are only taking care of them. Not exactly we are building a production level assembler which can accommodate all these possibilities. Fine. So as a during the return, this is what happens. Contents of link register will be loaded back onto your PC. Fine. Okay. IO instructions. This is a mandatory. We can we may have many different input devices and output devices. So as to recognize the input and output devices, each devices, if at all we look at the Unix operating system, we have major device numbers and minor device numbers, which uni uniquely identifies the devices. But in our SIC machine, we have a mechanism of representing every device by a hexadecimal number, a eight bit hexadecimal number. So, and the devices need also to be declared when you are declaring the variables and constants, all these things. <laughs> Something like here, we are declaring an input device. I'm calling the device name as 
in INDEV, in device. So, which is declared as a byte. I will talk about these declarations just next to it. Okay. And X there is indicating that it is an hexadecimal. And the name of the device, we are calling it by the name F5. The input device, we are naming it as F5. Fine. Okay. And similarly, output device, we are naming it by the name 08. Right. So, this is uh, a notation that we use to identify the devices uniquely. If you are using the devices in your program, you are supposed to explicitly declare them in your program. We'll see that in the programming examples. So when you are using any input device or output device, you can either read from the device, if it is an input device, you either write into device if it is an output device. So before these two operations, either of these two operations that you perform, you are supposed to, uh, what do you call it? Test the device. The device, whether it is free or is free. If at all you remember in our computer organization, we have different types of IO controls program controlled IO, memory mapped IO, like this. So, the technique what we are using in this SIC machine is program controlled IO, wherein program itself checks whether the device is busy or ready and it performs the operation. When the device is ready, that's how the things are working. Here we are using program control line. Your program need to continuously check. So the device is tested first, and uh, based on the result of the testing of the device, your conditional code is set. If the conditional code is zero zero, which indicates the device is busy. If the conditional code is either zero one or one zero, then the device is free. So you can perform a read or a write operation. And the device is free. That's how the things work. Let's see the example. So there are two instructions RD, WD. RD for read device, WD for write device. Either read device or write device will transfer one byte or eight bits of contents to accumulator or from accumulator. If it is a read, data is taken from the device and is placed into accumulator. If it is a write, Data is taken from the accumulator and written onto the device. So these are the two instructions what we have. RD for read, WD for write. Okay, in either of the case, 8 bits of data is getting transferred. Fine. Let's see further. This is how we should test the device. So we are checking whether uh, test device in device jump equal to input. If it is uh, equal. Means if the conditional code is equal, we will go back to input. Means we will be repeating this until the device become free. Okay. So this is how we are going to be testing the device. And once if it is not equal, what is not equal? Conditional code is not equal. We will perform read device in device. At this time, one byte of data is getting transferred from the input device and will be placed onto your accumulator. Similarly, I do have an example of uh, write. We are just using the out loop, which is a uh, label, wherein we are testing the device. If it is equal to, we are going back and repeating again and again until it becomes either 10 zero or 0, zero 001. So then we are going to perform a write operation, write device, out device. So this is about the input output instructions. This is the same even in the case of SACX. Only we are going to see those instructions which are just different from SIC in SICX. There are some few additional instructions which only we are going to study during that time. So the entire set of instructions will remain because SIC is a upward computable. Whatever the instructions works in SIC will also work in SICX. But only those extra instructions of SICX will not work in SIC. That's all the things. For example, SIC XC provides you the register to register operation. But SIC doesn't provide you register to register operation. It only provides you the register to memory operations. Right? Okay. We shall proceed further. Yeah. The next thing is called assembler directory. Still now, data transfer instructions, we did arithmetic instructions, uh, logical instructions, branch instructions, sub subroutine jump instructions. All these things we have seen. So these are instructions which perform some work 
which either performs a data transfer or calculations or control transfer either of these things this one will go to perform but now the next category what we do have is assembler directives which we can tell that they are not instructions they are the guidance or the specification to the assembler itself regarding how the assembling of the program must be done they i can tell that it is they are called as side effect instructions See, i can I cannot call that as instruction also they are side effect things which will going to inform your assembler about how to assemble the program they have the guidance to your assembler we have many such assembler directives which we shall see one by one and few of them we'll going to see during our uh, sic xe also which are not needed in our sic machine those things we we'll going to see that the first assembler directive is start we have used in the earlier examples also the start indicates the start of the program and how to write this start this is the syntax what you should follow you can give your own name of the program whatever the name you want you can give program name space start space the address what is this address this address is an indication to your assembler what address assembling should start first instruction address there are two types of assembling that is possible one is absolute suppose i have specified the address 2000 means the first instruction of your program will be placed at 2000 in the memory in the memory during execution also what if 2000 address is not available when you are want to run the program then the program cannot be executed there's a problem with your absolute assembly for that reason what we can do is we can go for a relative address means to say i don't specify the address specifically 2000 but instead i'll going to specify the address 0000 so all the programs are means all, the entire program will be assembled start considering the starting address of the first instruction as 2000 sorry 000 and if suppose when you are executing the program address 5000 is free yes your program can be run because 0000 plus 5000 will going to be starting from 5000 if 5000 is not available next time you want to run it at uh, 3000 to 300 fine you need to add 3300 to the starting address that's it everything any any free location your program can be executed that's what we call it as a reallocatable code we'll talk about this in detail later on also but as of now i am telling you. so either you can specify the absolute address or else you can specify the relative address absolute address means a specific address relative address means starts from 000 and adjust that after assembly during the loading of the program that's what we mean by that. we have an example here the name of the program we have given as add some start and the address where it's supposed to start is 2000 means the first uh, instruction should start from 2000 that's what it means the next assembler directive we have is end this as simple as that it indicates the end of the program that's it okay end start whatever the start you have started you can end and these assembler directives are also used for declaration of variables and constants luckily in our sic we have only two data types one is character type other one is integer type so we have either integer variable integer constant Uh, character variable character constant these things need to be declared so for this we use a specific uh, words for uh, specific symbols for declaration i will get this and the interesting important thing to be remembered is this is intent intentionally made feature the declarations of either the variables or constants must be done at the end of the program in all other programming languages we have seen that we use usually will make the declarations At the, uh, at, during the time of use, or else at the beginning of the program, but intentionally in SIC, the declarations are kept at the end of the. When you write the code first, the declaration should be written at the end of the program. Why is it so? Uh, when we build the assemblers, we'll come to that. Huh? So this is how it works. Sir. So the integer declaration first is the constant integer constant means integer constant is one word any any value that particular integer constant can take. that is specified by using an assembler directive word w o r d can you see that i have highlighted that that's the assembler directive fine word is used to declare the integer constant and you can see that max 
word f what it means is max is the name of the constant it is a co integer constant so word the word word indicating that it is an integer constant and right now the value or the value of your constant max is a 10 which will not change which will not change because it is a constant getting the idea okay similarly zero is a integer constant the name is a dro is an integer constant whose value is zero right this is how we can declare the integer constants right one more we have a integer constant name is er whose value is 300 right so like this way you can declare any number of integer constants the uh, assembler directive for declaring the integer constant is word fine similarly integer variables is declared by using an assembler directive resw reserve word resw that is that means re reserve word resw so this is an example and uh, resw allocates three bytes of memory that is one word of memory because the integer variable is 24 bits or three words array resw 100 means name is array reserve word how many words you are reserving 100 words each word is of three bytes so totally 300 bytes will be reserved means you are creating an array of 100 integers you are creating an array of 100 integers and it is a variable it can its value can change right similarly some resw one so now it is only one word so three bytes is reserved for your sum next we go for the character declaration so as a quick integer constants are declared by assembler directive w o r d and the integer variables are declared by using the assembler directive r e s w is a word similarly in the character declaration also we have byte character variable is sorry okay yeah uh, we are talking about the character constant declaration character constants as i have told earlier are of two types one is decimal characters just characters characters ascii characters other one is hexadecimal character constants can be character constants or hexadecimal constants right so hello yeah yes call me later i am in class Hello, very sorry for the disturbance. So, character constants are declared by using byte, b y t. Byte is assembler directive, and if the byte you want is a character, it is after the byte you are supposed to specify in a single quote the c, c in a single quote, which indicates further whatever you are getting is a character constant. For example, here EOF byte, how many bytes? End of file, that entire string is a constant. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 characters together is your character constant, right? and uh, we have seen this in device earlier we have declared the uh, device earlier in the previous slide in the rd and wd instructions in device byte x and uh, fy uh, and i can see some uh, doubts being uh, asked in the chat so somebody has asked that one one if it is conditional code is one one what happens that conditional code itself is not Yes, see, please try to understand it's not a real machine. 
is a hypothetical question. I am just explaining you the how what are the rules for playing the game. We should play accordingly. That's it. It's not a real mission to test how what happens. If it is 8086, we can test what happens. But this is an SIC machine. This is a reference machine for us to learn the machine dependent features of the assemblers, loaders, linkers. That's the thing. Please keep in mind. And it's, a, it's a totally a hypothetical machine. So what is the information we have? We need to play the game accordingly. Fine. So hexadecimal constant we can declare by having an X in a single quotes. And here in device is a character constant because byte is assembler directly used. X is a hexadecimal indication and F5 is the name of the device. Got the idea? Find that. Next, when we want to declare a character variable, we use assembler directive RESB is a byte. So for example, here we are declaring a string of 100 bytes, RESB 100, 100 bytes. You have a character string or a string of 100 bytes. Okay. Now we shall see some programs. We have hardly some 10, 15 minutes. Some few programs we are going to see. The first program is a simple one. Data from uh, 5 to alpha and transfer a character from CXZ to C5. Please observe here. I'll uh, show you the entire program. You can see from 5 word alpha, RESW, CXZ, all these things are the declarations. As I mentioned in SAC and SACXC program, the declaration will come after the program comes first. Okay, let's see there. Transfer start, as I have not mentioned any address, we will going to start assembly starting from 000. Load accumulator with the 5. What is there in the 5? Five? 5 is a word. Word means it is an integer constant. Right? Integer constant. And this value right now is 25. Means 25 value, that is integer constant 5, need to be put into accumulator. Yes, that's what happens. And store accumulator, that is 25 is accumulator content, is now stored into alpha. What is alpha? Alpha is declared as R R -E -S -W. That is reserve word. Means it's a variable. Alpha is a variable. 5 is a constant. The constant value 5 is loaded onto accumulator and using STL uh, uh, instruction, we are storing it onto alpha. Right? Next instruction is LDCH. Load character. From where? CSZ. What is CSZ? CSZ is declared as a byte. That means character constant. What is the value of CSZ? One character Z. Right? No, no need to be one character. It can be any number of characters, which if it is more number of characters, we would have stored that. One. Same thing. Same thing. STCH, STCH is a stored character. It is stored into C1. C1 is a RESB. That is a character variable. Getting the idea? Word is character integer constant. RESW is integer variable. Byte is a character constant, RESB is a character variable. Fine. So, what this program is doing, copying the contents of 5 to uh, alpha and also copying the contents of uh, uh, CHZ to uh, CHZ to C. That's what it is trying to do. Fine. Let's move on to the next program, SAC program. Uh, this program is to transfer the contents of one string to the other. Quick, have a look at this. Ah, we'll see the entire program. Here we are declaring a string one as a constant whose uh, value is a system software, right? And we are declaring string two as a string variable or a character variable. And we have a count 15 because system software count is 15. And z is zero. We are loading the z, that is zero value onto x. I cannot load the zero directly onto x. Why? I'll tell you later. And we are taking the ldch str one comma x. What is in x now? That is zero. That is first character of string one is taken, and stch in str two of x, that is str two of zero. We are copying this uh, s from the system software onto uh, string 2, right? After that, 
TIX inspection. I told you, X will be incremented. Yes, X will be incremented. Now X is one and is compared with the count. Count is how much? 50. It's not uh, equal or not greater. It is less than. So we are using if J less than, go back to loop. Now X has become one and uh, str of 1 is copied to str1 of 1 will be copied to str2 of 1. Similarly, all the 25 characters, sorry, all the 15 characters will be copied from str1 to str2. There are some more uh, examples there, right? This is a program to read 10 bytes of data from input device and store it in a string. Same, we are taking a z, z is uh, uh, now how much? Yeah, Z is zero. And uh, we are testing the input device. If it is equal, we go back and test it again. Keep on repeating it. And we'll read the device, in device means we'll transfer one byte. And we store that one byte, which is in the accumulator to the str one of X, str one of zero. And uh, we again use TIX to increment the X content and compare it with the count. Count here is 10, because we are supposed to read 10 bytes. Fine. This is how we are uh, writing the hex program. The drawback of SAC program, if you look at, we don't have any immediate addressing mode. So this is the end of SIC architecture and the programming examples. Okay, so we'll be stopping it here. Mm, and uh, uh, we'll going to be stopping the class here. Next class, we're going to see the SIC XE architecture and uh, then we'll continue with the assemblers in the same class, fine. Thank you, thank you for joining.